It's beginning to rain, rain, rain in the voice of our Father. Saying, whosoever will come drink of this water, I promise to pour my spirit out on your sons and your daughters. If you're thirsty and dry, look up to the sky. It's beginning to rain. Hello, friends. This is Tex Mars, inviting you to worship with us today at Bible Home Church, coming to you from Austin, Texas. Well, friends, it's so great to be with you again, to visit and share each week from the Word of God uh, on a very important subject. And today's topic, well, I don't know of anything that is more vital and necessary and in fact it's been necessary and vital since the beginning of time you see because god foresaw that his son would die on the cross for our sins and so today we're going to be talking about a subject that i think you're going to enjoy because it gets right down to the heart of the gospel we're going to start a new series entitled the power of the blood the power of the blood you know, a lot of people realize, at least those that are Christians, that Jesus did shed his blood on the cross for us. But I'm not so sure that every Christian understands the significance of that for our daily lives. You see, that imbues us, empowers us in such a magnificent way that, well, you'll have to listen to this, <laughs> this series because it is... It is life-changing. In fact, I'll have to tell you, even though I've been a Christian since the age of 16, when I was uh, saved at, at a, a church in Port Natchez, Texas, gave my life to the Lord and was baptized, not since then, I, I don't think has God fully touched me in such a way as be, when I began to study and investigate the power of the blood. I've had people say to me, well, now, Tex... Are you talking about mystical, supernatural power? I say, yes, indeed. They go, well, now, isn't that a little far out? <laughs> I always like it when people ask, is my Christian faith far out? Well, of course it's far out. <laughs> of course, the world doesn't believe these things. They don't believe that Jesus rose from the dead, that Jesus triumphed over the devils. They don't believe that Jesus sits uh, there on the great throne in heaven. The world doesn't believe that he's coming again. And uh, even uh, the women who now, because it's uh, popular to do so as a fashion statement of some kind, who wear the cross around their necks, don't truly believe in the cross. At least most of them don't. Even Madonna wears a cross and crucifix. You know, the reprobate uh, rock uh, popular singer. So, you see, my friends, there is power. Do I believe in the mystical, supernatural power of God? You better believe I do. I've always believed that. How did I get such a, a strange, unusual belief? Well, I read the Bible. And you can have that same belief if you'll just read the Bible. And everything in there is powerful. The miracles of, of Jesus the casting out of devils. Oh, I could just, we could do sermons and sermons on the miracles of Jesus, even raising Lazarus from the dead. And the world would say that's not possible. Well, I don't really care what the world says, but I do care what the Bible tells us, and that's true. So I think you're going to really enjoy this, and it will change your life. Surely, and we're going to have three sessions on this, surely in the next three sermons, the next three programs, there will be a few new little wrinkles that you've never thought of. You say, oh, my, you know, this is this is really the milk of the word. This is fine for new Christians, but, you know, I've been a Christian a while. I get a little bit boring with sermons like, well, listen, you're not going to be bored. It's going to change your life, so you stick with us. I think you're going to enjoy it. Before we begin, I wanted to mention a couple of things to you, and now... 
I'm not a big believer in the social welfare ministry, except even Jesus Christ had the, uh, the the loaves of bread and the fish. Even he fed the multitudes, and then he preached to them. I sort of like that. You know, that used to be the old role of the Salvation Army. I had great respect when I was just a young man for the Salvation Army. I remember going to Beaumont, Texas. It was the nearest city to where I lived. It had about 100,000 population. And back then, you were real safe to go places. And I remember I would take the city bus and go downtown. And they had a little area there by the river, and they had a church. i never forget it. It was called the Church of the Open Door. And you know, it has, had its doors open 24 hours a day right there downtown. There was never any vandalism. Nobody ever broke in and harmed that church. Nowadays, they can't even do that. They have to keep their doors locked in cities. Right across from the Church of the Open Door was the Salvation Army. It was right next to a park. And, you know, they would meet over there, and I would hear the music and see what was going on over there. And they were really telling people about Jesus and the blood of the cross. And the people were being saved. And uh, then they were they had a, a, a place over there, like a little shelter. And they were giving out some jackets because it was bitter cold. I remember one time I was there, and just bitter cold. And I went over there, and I played with some of the poor kids. We played at basketball sort of in a little uh, say sort of, you know, because it wasn't much of a basketball game as we were kids, uh, but there in the city park, and I remember that. And it's been one of my greatest shocks and disappointments to see today that the Salvation Army has become almost just a tool in the arm of the federal government and of the United Way. And, uh, you know, they went along with the government to get money from the government in the United Way. They had to agree not to require a man or a woman who was homeless to attend worship service to be fed. They used to say, come on, we'll give you shelter, we'll give you food. All you have to do is listen to a sermon. <laughs> you say, well, now, Tex, they were bribing those people. Well, call it bribing, call it what you, whatever you want. But we have no obligation except from God to help feed and shelter the needy. But I think it was perfectly acceptable to say, if you want a free handout... What's wrong with hearing about Jesus? And I'm sure some of those men would shuffle in there and say, well, if I have to, I have to. Okay. I'll sit there. I don't want to, but if it helps me to get a, a nice warm cot and a clean sheets and a shower and, and to get some food, okay, I'll do it. And you know, a lot of them found Jesus Christ. They began to listen to that. Sometimes you, you, you know, you go in for the wrong reasons and you come out with the right kind of heart. So <laughs> these things do happen. And I appreciate it so much to Salvation Army, but they have changed. Now they, 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 they will tell you if you call the Salvation Army, they do not require men to attend sermons and hear about Jesus. In fact, I was in a state of shock about 15 years ago even. I remember visiting a huge, uh, uh, Bible-like convention in uh, Los Angeles, California. Greater Los Angeles Sunday School Association, I think it was called. And I saw all of these Salvation Army people in their uniforms. There were men and women. And I knew that they were pastors and counselors and such of the Salvation Army. And I was one of the speakers there. And I, I, I talked about the Bible and exposed the New Age movement. And I found that a number of the Salvation Army people in their bright new uniforms came up and began to criticize me after my talk. Come to find out, they didn't even believe in the Bible being inerrant anymore. They also believed that the New World Order was a good thing. It was unbelievable. I, these people were totally unlike the men and women I had met as a young man in the Salvation Army. Totally changed. And it shows what can happen when that spirit of being lukewarm attacks something that has been so pure and wonderful for uh, so many uh, decades and years. And so we need to pray for the Salvation Army. Now, we need your love gifts and offerings here at Bible Home Church. We have our needs. We have our radio time and all of the expenses. I wish everything was free, but it's not, my friends. And only, only Jesus' salvation is free. So we need your help with Bible Home Church. Well, we're going to have a song here first. And we are going to have as much of the sermon as we can today. Probably not very much, but first we're going to have a beautiful song from the cathedrals, from their faithful album, He Made a Change.
Today we're going to be examining something that is so powerful, so mighty, that there is nothing on earth or in heaven, anywhere in the universe, that can compare. I'll tell you, I, I feel so inadequate to talk about this subject, more so than any that I've ever discussed, because I think I feel, well, reverent. I, th that's the only word that... I can use. I, I feel reverent. You see, let me explain something to you. I guess I'm just old-fashioned. Yes, I, I, I must admit, I still believe in the sanctity of God. Not too long ago, I was watching a television station, a Christian, so-called so Christian station, and a man got on there and he claimed that he had had a visit from Jesus. And he said, you know, uh, Jesus came to see me right about Christmas time, and he just walked into my living room, and he was wearing a three-piece suit. And Jesus sat down on the couch beside me, and he told me what he wanted me to do in my ministry this coming year. And Jesus and I had a big chat. Well, right away, I knew the man was a devil for saying that. It wasn't true. couldn't be true. You see, Jesus doesn't come to men in three-piece suits. He, he doesn't sit on your couch and chat with you. I'm not saying that you can't talk to God. You certainly can. In fact, God wants you to do that. He wants to be your friend. Jesus said, I'm your friend. But it was so sacrilegious, the way this man described it, that I had to compare it with the book of Revelation. The apostle John said that Jesus came to him. Now, remember, this is the apostle that had laid his head on the breast of Jesus, the beloved Apostle John. Here was John, though. Uh, some say that he was approaching the last days of his life, that he was in his late 90s, a very old man, banished to the Isle of Patmos. And God gave him this vision, and Christ Jesus himself came. And let me tell you, when John saw him, John said... That when he beheld the Lamb, his feet were like a fiery furnace. His, his hair was like fine white wool. And John immediately knew this was God. Yes, it was. this was, a, was the same Christ Jesus that John had walked those dusty roads <laughs> toward Jerusalem with. But something was changed in one sense because... This 
Jesus was so almighty, so powerful, like a consuming fire, John says, I fell at his feet as if dead. You know, friends, when we get in the presence of God, I believe we will fall at his feet as if dead. Doesn't mean he doesn't love us. He does. It means that he is so holy. You know, the Old Testament prophet talked about being called up before God. But when he got up there, he, he said, I'm undone. I can't speak because <laughs> I'm unclean. He was, uh, he couldn't even speak in the presence of God. Let me tell you something, my friends. If you're called into God's presence, I don't think you're going to be chatting to a man in a three-piece suit. You're not going to be discussing the, the price of tea in China. It's going to be a holy, holy experience. Please join us next week as Pastor Mars continues his series, The Power of the Blood. If you're thirsty and dry, look to the sky, it's beginning to rain. You've been listening to Pastor Tex Mars and Bible Home Church. Please join with us in worship next week as we continue to honor the remarkable Word of God. It's beginning to rain, rain, rain in the voice of our Father. Sing, whosoever will come drink of this water. I promise to pour my spirit out on your sons and your daughters. If you're thirsty and dry, look up to the sky. It's beginning. Hello friends, this is Tex Mars, inviting you to worship with us today at Bible Home Church, coming to you from Austin, Texas. Hello friends, thank you for joining with us this week as Pastor Mars continues his series, The Power of the Blood. But first, some beautiful music by the Cathedral Quartet, a portion of the medley off of their CD, the Cathedral Quartet 25th Anniversary, and the song, Somebody Touched Me. One day he touched that crippled man, then he made him walk again. Now the master saw with pleasure, he had labor not in vain. Like the story of that crippled man, I too was bound by sin, but since my master came, oh praise his name, thank God I now can say, somebody. see, God is so holy, and we are so unclean in this presence. And yet, if you know Jesus Christ, you're saved, you're born again. I know all of that. 
I realize that. But still, there is a, a tall gap between the holiness of God and men and our uncleanness. And you know, that's the whole subject I want to talk about today. That uncleanness that is made clean and whole only by one thing, the blood of Jesus Christ. You can't get clean any other way. You, you can't get uh, polished up. You're not fit for heaven by any other route or any other source. There's no magic. There's there's not going to be some drug that the pharmaceutical companies develop. There's not going to be some herb or vitamin that they discover that's going to make you new. Only the blood of Jesus Christ. And I want to talk to you about the blood of Christ today. And as I said, it's a very serious and solemn subject. And I don't know of any more important thing that we could talk about. Now, for those of you who say, oh, no, Texas is going to give us a sermon today. I, I was hoping he'd expose the New World Order or the New Age Movement. Well, I'm going to have to disappoint you because I'm going to talk about the subject today that God put in my heart. And I believe this is the dearest and most precious and vital subject ever be discussed. And we as Christians, we seem to forget sometimes the blood of Jesus and its power. I want to propose something to you, fellow Christian, that Christ's blood is the power of God. It is the very power of God. Sometimes we come against all kinds of adversities. In your life, every day, you come upon hard times, people that are opposed to you, things that aren't, aren't right. You have walls to climb, obstacles to overcome. And let me tell you something. There's only one way the Christian can overcome all, and that's the power of the blood. You can't get a Ph.D. that'll help you. You, you can't finagle your way into this. But I'm here to propose that the blood of the cross is so very powerful, it means everything to you. So many people want to expose things, but they don't do it by sprinkling the blood of Jesus Christ on their circumstances. And that's a great danger. And let me tell you, it's a great fallacy because you can't receive healing, not for your sins, not for your body, without the blood. You can't overcome the beast and the new world order without the blood. In fact, my friends, you can do nothing without the blood. A lot of people say, but Tex, you've got a, a powerful ministry. You've got a voice. You're, well, listen, I'm here to tell you, my voice is nothing. It's puny. If it were not for the power of the blood, Tex Moore's voice would be extinguished tomorrow morning. I don't even think it would last the night. The only thing that is keeping me alive on this planet today, I believe, is the blood of Christ. There are people out there, I could give you names of people who wish that I were dead. But they can't touch me. Not until God says, Tex Mars, your time is up. And I must tell you, and this may sound very stupid to those who don't understand what I'm talking about, but frankly, I'd rather be with Jesus than right here on earth anyway. So you crazies out there, you think you can come take my life? Well, I, I think my wife will miss me a lot. <laughs> I, I know she will. I love her. But I'll be in a better place. You see, the blood of Christ protects me here on earth. And when it's God's time for Tex Mars to go on to heaven and to be with the Lord Jesus, I, I'm going to tell you right now, I can't wait for the day that I get to heaven and fall at his feet as if dead, just like the Apostle John. I can't wait. For that day. And I think I'll be crying out like the Old Testament prophet. Uh, Woe is me. I am undone. Because I'm in the presence of, of God. And I'm unclean. But I know something. I know that Jesus Christ promised in his word. That he would lift me up. And regardless of my faults. And my transgressions. And my sins. Through faith in the blood of Christ. I will overcome. And that's part of of the new covenant, which is, by the way, the blood of Christ Jesus. 
Now, first, I want you to know, my friends, that there are many people opposed to the blood of Christ. In all of the New Age teachings, I find they are opposed to the blood. Alice Bailey of the Lucis Trust scornfully calls Christianity that bloody religion. Not too long ago, they had a big feminist convention. They had Methodists and Lutherans and Baptists and oh, Unitarians and I don't know what all kinds of, of ladies. I have a list of them. I call them ladies. They don't want to be called ladies. It was the Reimagining God conference in Minneapolis a few years back. All the goddess worshipers were there, the pagans, the, so forth. One of the, the primary things they taught was the horror of this teaching of the blood of Christ. They also said that Christianity, as taught by traditional Christians, was a bloody religion. Seems to be sort of the, the standard thing for Luciferians and others to say that Christianity is a bloody religion. You know, some people have exposed the Word of Faith movement. Kenneth Hagin has probably been called the father of the Word of Faith movement. You know, that's this name it and claim it gospel, this, you know, uh, speak positive, uh, positive confessions and you'll get whatever you want to. Well, you know that's false teaching, so it has to be that they probably don't have a very true concept of the blood of Christ. Let me quote to you from Kenneth Hagin. Here's what he says. He says, he, that is Jesus tasted spiritual death for every man. And his, that is Jesus, spirit and inner man went to hell in my place. Can't you see that, says Hagen? Physical death would not remove your sins. So Jesus tasted death for every man. He's talking about tasting spiritual death. Yes, Kenneth Hagen says, as does Kenneth Copeland and many of the other Word of Faith teachers, they say that Jesus Christ died and went to hell, and there he overcame the devil and was born again as a man. They say that his death didn't avail anything, that the blood of the cross didn't do any good, that he had to go down into hell and there overcome. Well, the Bible tells us that Jesus Christ did indeed descend into hell for three days, and they weren't happy to see him down there. <laughs> There's no doubt about that. The Bible says he was triumphant. He preached to the spirits in hell, in fact. Can you imagine how nervous and sweaty the devil was down there? That was an especially hot day down in Hades, let me tell you. But I want you to understand, when Christ went down there, triumphant, and remember now, he was triumphant. He had already finished things. You remember his last words on the cross? It is finished. He didn't have to go down in hell and finish anything. It was over with, my friends. The debt had been paid. He gave his life on the cross. He shed his blood. The power of the blood removed your sins and mine. Well, Kenneth Hagin doesn't believe that. He also believes that Jesus tasted spiritual death. Well, how can you possibly taste spiritual death when you're God? You see, God is a spirit. How can God die spiritually? Does God have to be born again? <laughs> My friends, Jesus said, I am. He always was God. He was in, uh, with God in the beginning and was God. Read that in John 1. And so Jesus could not possibly be separated from the Father. For he and the Father are one. And the Holy Spirit is right there with them. They are one. First John says there are three that bear record in heaven. Three. And these three are one. So we get to the essence of Jesus Christ. He shed his blood and tasted physical death as a man. But his spirit lived on because Jesus said, and you can read this in the Gospels, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. It didn't die. You remember Jesus also told the sinner there who, who had turned to Christ and repented and said, Lord, remember me when you go into your reward. And Jesus said, this day you will be with me in paradise. Oh, no, my friends. There was no going down to hell for atonement. 
That's not where the atonement occurred. The atonement occurred when the Lamb of God, slain from the foundation of the world, died physically on that cross. He could not be split apart from the Father. Now, I want you to read Psalms 22 and 23, and you're going to understand why Jesus said, Lord, Lord, why hast thou forsaken me? Because that's a verse, certainly in the New Testament, but you go back and you read Psalms. And just a few verses later, Jesus is quoted as saying, but you haven't forsaken me. You didn't forsake the prophets and you certainly wouldn't forsake me. Now, that's in Psalms 22 and 23. We're not talking about that today, but that's worthy of of a whole sermon. Today, I want to talk to you about the blood. Again, I tell you that the false cults, the false religions hate the blood of Christ. A book by Dr. Kathy Burns is called Mormonism, Masonry, and Godhood. She shows that the Mormons are basically Masons, at least the founders of Mormonism were, and that most of the rituals and uh, sacraments of the Mormon church are based on the Masonic Lodge. She quotes a Mormon apostle, so-called, Legrand Richards. He writes, quote, One erroneous teaching of many Christian churches is, by faith alone we are saved. LeGrand Richards, this Mormon apostle, says that this is a false doctrine. (laughs) By faith alone we are saved. This, he says, is a false doctrine. Well, right away, I knew when I read that, that if the Mormon founders taught that by faith alone we are saved, that that's a false doctrine, if they taught that, They probably were pretty confused and devilish when it got down to the doctrine of the blood of Christ. Because the very fact is that if you understand the doctrine of the blood of Christ, by faith alone you will be saved. (laughs) So I knew if I studied, I would find that Mormonism didn't really believe in the blood of Christ and its power of redemption. And you know, sure enough, I found that the Mormons teach that Jesus Christ's blood was inadequate. In fact, there's a Mormon doctrine called blood atonement. They teach that there are some sins by Mormons so heinous that Christ's blood cannot atone for them. That's right. In fact, Brigham Young, you know there's Brigham Young University there in Utah, one of the the, the founders of the Mormon faith. He took over from Joseph Smith. He said that some sins such as murder are so heinous that the person's own blood would be required. And that's the only way they could be atoned and go to heaven, (laughs) by atoning for their own blood. Well, there are certainly laws that say, you know, an eye for an eye, and you kill somebody, you might get the electric chair or the firing squad or death by legal injection, but I don't think that's going to save you. That's not the blood atonement of the cross. You cannot shed your blood and be saved has nothing to do. We're talking about the only thing that can save, and that is the blood of Jesus Christ. You're not the Lamb of God. He is the Lamb of God. That's why we read in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 18 and 19, For as much as ye know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold, but with the precious blood of Christ. You know, even this body is a corruptible thing. And even if you commit suicide for your sins, that won't save you because your body is corrupt. All you've done is destroy something corrupt. But once you believe in the blood of Christ and Christ Jesus comes in to dwell in you and you have the power of the blood in your life, then if you commit suicide, well, you're harming the temple of God. Which you are, Paul said. Why are you the temple of God? Because you're so special, you're so clean, you're so perfect? No. You are made a new man, a new woman in Jesus Christ. But you're still mortal. You're still struggling with the flesh and with temptation. What makes you the temple of God is that the one who shed his blood for you has come to live inside you. And the Bible says that you are sealed unto the day of redemption. And the Apostle Paul said that's why you should not sin, for it grieves the Holy Spirit by which you are sealed unto the day of redemption. It's that blood. The blood has sealed you. 
Now let me tell you something, my friends. This is something very mystical. It's something miraculous. Do you realize that when Jesus came to live in you, you have the very power of that blood? You are not that blood, but you have the working power, the miraculous working power available to you of Jesus' blood shed on the cross? In Hebrews 9, verse 14, we read, How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? A lot of people out there doing great things, humanitarians. Well, I'm telling you right now, you can be a billionaire and give every cent you've got to the poor, to charity. And the Bible says that's just dead works. But when you believe and accept and are saved through the blood of Christ Jesus, that eternal spirit lives in you and you serve the living God. And there's nothing to do with dead works there. You are alive in Christ Jesus. Some people say, Tex, what do you hope to accomplish by talking about the blood of Christ and its power? Well, I'm going to read to you from the book of Acts. This is my responsibility. This is my obligation. I don't have any recourse. I can't tell God I'm not going to talk about the blood. It says there in Acts 20, verse 28, Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God which he hath purchased with his own blood. You see, I am a leader. God has given me this ministry. A lot of people say the IRS can take it away from you. No, they can't take away this from me. <laughs> they can take away my tax exempt status. That's not my ministry. The government, they say, can come shut you down. Oh, no, the government can't shut me down. My ministry might conform just a little bit, might, you know, be dramatically changed. I could go from preaching on the radio to preaching in a prison cell. <laughs> but that's not going to change my ministry. And God says that I'm an overseer. God says I should take heed not only to myself, but to all the flock. And the Holy Ghost has made me an overseer, and I'm to feed the church of God. And why is this important that I feed you, brother and sister? It's because God purchased you, 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 the church of God, with his own blood. Some people say, well, that must make me very important that God purchased me with his own blood. No, it makes God important. You and I are just wretched people. We were. We were deserving of nothing but the, but the flames of hell. And he loved us anyway, not because you were worth anything. I heard a sermon not too long ago, and the pastor said, Oh, we must really be important. Do you, can you imagine your, you need to have self-esteem, build up your self-esteem, knowing that you're so vital and important that God loves you so much he gave his life on the cross. That's not true. He didn't give his life on the cross because you were worth so much. It's just the opposite. When he gave his life on the cross and shed his blood, his blood was able to transform you into something. You were not able to be transformed yourself. The Masons say through good works, we can make a person a better man. But the Bible says your good works are dead. And the blood of Christ <laughs> will make you a new man. Washed in the blood of Christ. Washed in the blood. There's that old hymn about being washed in the blood. When I was a little kid, I just accepted it. Not too long ago, somebody asked me, Tex Morris, please explain to me, what does it mean to be washed in the blood? You can't really be washed in the blood. It's not like putting your body in a washing machine and putting blood in and washing you and cleansing you. Well, I knew right away that person didn't know Jesus Christ. They didn't know Jesus Christ. I don't think they were being scornful. They were just ignorant. I'm telling you, my friends, when you are washed in the blood, it is something that God does that you cannot perform yourself. <laughs> I suppose he's that heavenly washing machine. And uh, <laughs> you're just a recipient of some kind of a 
miraculous detergent <laughs> that, that washes everything and, and leaves you without spot or blemish. Now, you one time could have been an adulterer. You could have been a whoremonger. You could have been a prostitute. You could have been a drunk. You could have been a liar. You could have been a cheat. Paul says, which <laughs> we once were, but you're not anymore. Not after the blood washes you. Then you're a new creature in Christ. And you're made for service to God to perform live works for God. It strikes me, when we're talking about the blood, that we really cannot walk with God. We cannot have communion with God without the liberty of Christ, which the blood imparts to us. I was recently reading again 1 John chapter 5, verse 8. One of my favorite verses in the Bible it says, There are three that bear witness on earth, the Spirit and the water and the blood, and these three agree in one. What does that mean? Three that bear witness on earth, the Spirit and the water, and the blood. And these agree in one. Let me explain this to you. God has put on my heart to understand this. It's very clear that only through the Holy Spirit will you truly understand the meaning of Jesus Christ shedding His blood on the cross. And it is through the Holy Spirit, through faith in God's finished work, that you become a new man or new woman. You are born again, according to John Chapter 3, verse 3. Thus, the Spirit will bear witness on earth that you are of God. Now, when you come to know God and the Spirit bears witness in your heart that you're of God, then you'll want to do what God says and be baptized. And there, symbolically, is the water. This is an outward, it's a human act commanded by God to be observed. Your sins have been forgiven you. So God says, present yourself to God in baptism. Now, when you're being baptized, remember, you say, well, everybody out there is watching me. And I go there and they they put my body under and then immerse me. You know, so it can be done in a, in a pool. It can be done in a, a tank at your church. It can be done in a bathtub. It can be done in a uh, the River Jordan, uh, like Jesus. But wherever... Remember, you're presenting yourself to God. You're saying, God, I'm a new person. The Spirit has witness to me of the blood. So you have the Spirit and the water and the blood. Now, friends, if you're a Christian, you will respect and love and hold sacred the blood of Christ. Next week, Pastor Mars continues this series, The Power of of the blood. If you're thirsty and dry, look to the sky. It's beginning to rain. You've been listening to Pastor Tex Mars and Bible Home Church. Please join with us in worship next week as we continue to honor the remarkable Word of God. Inviting you to worship with us today at Bible Home Church, coming to you from Austin, Texas. Hello, friends. Thank you for joining with us this week as Pastor Mars continues his series, The Power of the Blood. But first, some beautiful music from the Cathedral Quartet off of a medley on their 25th anniversary CD, a song... Thanks to Calvary from that medley. Today I went back to the place where I used to go. Today I saw 
that same old crowd I knew before. When they asked me what had happened, I tried to tell them. Thanks to Calvary, I don't come here anymore. Thanks to Calvary, I'm not the man that I used to be. Thanks to Calvary, things are different than. I tried to tell them Thanks to Calvary I don't come here anymore Anymore You, you can't escape it. Somebody told me not too long ago they sent me some sermon materials by John MacArthur. He's a pastor out in California. And I was very, very discouraged and disappointed to read what John MacArthur said about the blood. He said the blood of Christ is of no real significance. It was just human blood. And when Jesus shed his blood, it just went into the earth. It wasn't the blood of Christ that saved us. It's his physical death. Well, I guess that's one step ahead of Kenneth Hagin, who says the physical death of Jesus means nothing. It's the spiritual death that means everything. But it's not enough, you see, because the Bible makes clear that the blood of Jesus was shed. Now, we can talk all day about what is it, the blood of God or the blood of a human. We do know that the Holy Spirit overshadowed Mary. There is no father on earth that conceived Jesus. There was no sperm. There's no DNA of a human father. Now, I'm not going to get into some technical uh, term and you know we could get a hematologist a blood expert to come in here we could discuss the chemistry of the blood and, and all of those things I'm just here to tell you that there is something miraculous and wonderful and totally undecipherable to the unsaved person about the blood you know in Leviticus it says that the blood is the life of all things the life is in the blood. I once read that it was really only in the last 150 years of human history that so-called doctors believed that there was life-giving power in the blood. Think about that. Life-giving power in the blood. But the Bible said over 2,000 years ago, the life is in the blood. And you know, that blood, without blood, without your blood flowing through your veins and up into your brain and through your heart, you're a dead person. Likewise, without the blood of Christ flowing through you, spiritually now, I'm talking about, you're a dead man. You're dead. Let's talk more about the blood of Christ. Now, remember, Jesus gave his life one time. We read in Hebrews, by his own blood, he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. Remember, they had to keep uh, 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 sacrificing the animals in the temple over and over and over in the Holy of Holies and sprinkle the blood. Well, by Jesus' own blood, he entered in once in the holy place. He doesn't have to keep doing it over and over. He just did it once. And in so doing, it says here in Hebrews, uh, and by the way, this is uh, chapter 9, verse 12. He obtained eternal redemption for us. Eternal. That's forever and ever and ever. He died one time physically, not spiritually. He can't. <laughs> Jesus is God. He can't die spiritually. He died one time physically, and his blood was shed. And that 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 supernatural powered blood did the work one time, 
and Christ uttered those tremendous words, it is finished. And that, that, that wall of separation that separated God and man, it was finished too. It was torn down. Remember the, the veil in the, the temple was rent? Oh yes. The power of the blood. I, I, I'm reading again in Revelation something powerful. Revelation 5 verse 6 talks about the Lamb of God. And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne stood a lamb, as it had been slain, having seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God. I want you to understand something. Here the lamb, who was slain, and there are seven spirits of God. You see, the spirits of God, the spirit of God, proceeds along with the blood. It goes hand in hand. You can't have the spirit of God without the blood. And this blood had the power to conquer sin and cleanse you from all imperfections. Now, this same blood is the everlasting covenant. Hebrews 13, verse 20 says that Jesus uh, uh, was brought again from the dead by the blood of the everlasting covenant. Do you understand that? Jesus was resurrected by the blood. The blood actually resurrected him. What do you think is going to resurrect you? My friends, you have a moral, corruptible body. And when you die and go into the earth, what do you think is going to resurrect you? But the blood of Christ. The blood resurrected God, Son, and it's going to resurrect you too. The blood has resurrection power. First John Chapter 1, verse 7 says, The blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanses us from all sin. Well, Mr. John MacArthur out there says, you know, the blood isn't important. Well, maybe it's not to him. Maybe he hadn't been cleansed from all his sin. Maybe he's not a saved person. But Tex Mars is here to tell you by the authority of the power of the Word of God that it is the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, which cleanses us us from all sins. We're cleansed in the blood of Christ. It cleanses you from all your sins. Jesus is the high priest, and by his blood we have a new covenant. My friends, if you have a heart made pure and clean by the blood, don't let Satan, the accuser, come to you and say, you have an imperfection. You have spots. You just say, depart from me, Satan. For by the blood of Christ, I have been made whole. I have been changed. I am a new person. And although I may be vulnerable to, to the flesh and so forth, you'll never have any of me, Satan, because I have the blood of Christ. You know, friends, I don't think you can have peace and harmony on this earth unless you have the blood of Christ. That's why sinners are never happy. They're never satisfied. One time I met a witch that came to know Christ. I guess she was the witch that switched. And she said, you know, when I was a witch, every time I did a sacrifice to the horn god Satan, I would feel real good for a while. I'd feel warm and fuzzy and, oh, I felt so good and powerful. She said, but you know, just a few short hours later was the come down. I felt dirty and trashy. I have to go do another ritual to try to recapture that good feeling. She said, and I went in cycles over and over and over again. I was never satisfied. I was never full. I had no peace. I was constantly in turmoil. The spirits, the devils, kept me in turmoil, she said. They had grasp of my life. I was a, I was a slave. I was a bondservant. To wickedness and to the ritual. Well, Jesus had one ritual that he did one time for your eternal redemption. Now, this witch found that out. She believed in Jesus. You know, one thing that she told me that I'll tell you changed my life. When I was talking to kids some years ago, I was talking to kids at a church, speaking to a youth group. This witch, she told me something. She said, you know... When I was a witch, we did vile things to children. 
And she said, but I noticed something in the neighborhood where I was. The children who I couldn't reach, I couldn't get a hold of, I couldn't manipulate. I didn't know why, but later, every case, in every instance, I found out that child had a Holy Ghost parent that he prayed over. He prayed the blood of Christ. You know, that witch couldn't get to those kids because the blood of Christ had been prayed over them. She couldn't do it. And she said that's when she turned to God. She said if the blood of Christ had the power that my master, Satan, could not touch those kids, I knew that he had lied to me. There was no power in my master. All the power was in Jesus, for he had the blood. Colossians 1, verse 20 says, God, having made peace through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all things unto himself, by him, whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. Do you realize that peace comes through the blood of the cross? There's nothing in earth that can be peaceful. There's nothing even in heaven that can be peaceful without the blood of Christ having been shed. Now, one of the things the Scripture says is that we are to be obedient. Jesus was obedient. Philippians 2, verses 8 and 9 says that he became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore, God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name above every name. You know, in the book of Revelation, is something so, so mighty. It says of the last days, saints that they loved not their life unto the death. They were willing to give their life. You know, I don't think anyone can really give their life unless they know that the one to whom they're giving the life, that, that, that there has been some kind of a miraculous experience that someone has shed their life for them. Now, let me explain what I'm talking about. You see, the Bible says that we overcome, we overcome the beast by the power of our testimony and the blood of the Lamb. A lot of folks have a powerful testimony. I don't doubt it at all. I've heard testimony of saved Christians and they make me cry tears. But their testimony by itself means nothing. Did you know that there's people out there giving fake testimonies? There's fake Christians out there. They're making up stories. And I read not too long ago, a pastor was exposed. He went before his congregation. Actually, he was an evangelist, went before this congregation. And, and he told them all the things that he had done wrong. He said, oh, I was once a, a drug addict. I was arrested 17 times for heroin possession. I spent six months in prison. I did all these things. And God changed me and made me a new person. And you know, that actually raised that man up in their esteem. There's something about Christians that's very strange and maybe good. When we see or we believe that the power of God has worked in a man, we praise Jesus for it. And when this pastor got up and bragged about all the evil things he'd been involved in, but that God had gotten him out of, the Christians clapped their hands and said, Amen, brother. He was held up even in greater esteem. And then he began to get even more reckless. And he added on a few more <laughs> transgressions. <laughs> it seems like you have to be the most smutty, dirty, horrible person on earth to get people to pay attention to you. The person with the worst testimony gets listened to the most. That's not necessarily the way it should be, friends. I remember the, the young ruler that came to Christ. He said, I've, Lord, what must I do to be saved? And Jesus said, well, have you obeyed? The law is I've obeyed the law ever since I was a child. I've never transgressed the law. Well, Jesus could see that he told the truth. Can you imagine a righteous person that had never transgressed the law? I didn't say he didn't sin, but in terms of the laws that the Jews had, he had, he had kept those faithfully. And Jesus said, there's one thing you lack. Give everything, all of your possessions, take and sell them and give the money to the poor and come. Follow me. See, Jesus read his heart. Jesus knows what is in the heart of every man. This man had been obeying all the laws. This young ruler, very powerful person. Everybody looked up to him. Oh, he was such a righteous person. 
obviously a person of great wealth. And Jesus knew that it was his wealth that was his downfall. And when Jesus required that of him, it was too much for the young ruler. And he went away very sadly. He wanted to follow Christ, but he didn't want to sacrifice and give up what he had in material possessions. We've got to be obedient to Christ, whatever he tells us to do. I one time asked God why he called me to this ministry because it's such a burden. I, I don't want to whine, but you know, I, I'm going to tell you right now, there are a lot of people that hate my guts. There are a lot of people that are angry. I, I can't even tell you how many vile letters I get sometime in the ministry. Now, I also don't want to whine because I get more positive mail. I get more wonderful Christians who write to me. Many, many more. But every time I get just one letter, it makes me feel bad. And I once asked God, I was complaining, and I asked God, why why did you choose me for this? Why didn't you why didn't you choose somebody that was more that had more power, had more say, maybe was hooked in and had connections with big denominations, had a lot of money? Why did you choose me? Because I'm just I just frankly, God, I'm just too weak to do this. This ministry. And you know, God every once in a while will actually speak to you. He speaks to you all the time when you pray. You feel it in your heart. But I'm telling you, it's almost as if the words are, are carved in stone. It's like Moses. You know, you're given these, these, these bits of stone and you have to read them. <laughs> and that's the way God did me. And God answered my question. Because I was so distraught. I was under such terrific pressure. So many people were criticizing and condemning me for standing up to God, uh, for God. And you know why God told me? When I said, God, why me? Why did you choose me for this? It's just so hard. He answered me. He said, I knew you would do it. What that shut me up real fast. God knew I would do it. There's people more rich. There's people more smart. There's people with all kind of talents. But God just chose me because he knew I would do it. I guess the world would say, well, Tex, you're just stupid enough that you'd go out there and do those things. They get you in a lot of trouble. They get you in a real jam in the world. God knew I would be obedient. And that's very powerful. My friends, if you want the blood of Christ to have its all-sufficiency in your life, to turn your life around, then you've got to be obedient to the calling of Christ. Now, another thing that you need to have is faith. In Romans 3, verse 25, it says, Whom God hath set forth to be a propitiation through faith in His blood. See, Christ Jesus can't be a propitiation for you. He can't let you avail of that eternal redemption unless you have faith in His blood. I'm sorry about the Mormons that don't have faith in his blood. I'm sorry about John MacArthur that doesn't have faith in his blood. I'm sorry about the, the witches and the, the, the goddess worshippers that don't have faith in his blood. I'm sorry about Alice Bailey and the Lucis Trust people that don't have faith in his blood. Because without faith in the blood of Christ, you cannot be saved. He cannot be a propitiation for your sins. Not too long ago, a woman, she came all the way from Massachusetts to ask me one question. She said, how can I be saved? Well, I told her all about how she could be saved. I thought I was giving her the, you know, the, 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 royal, the royal Roman road. I mean, here it is. This is in the Bible. You've got to repent of your sins. And I told her all those things. And she said, I did all those. I said, you did? She said, oh, yes. But I still don't know if I'm saved. I said, well, there is one thing you like. She said, well, what is it? She'd come all the way from Massachusetts down here to, to Texas to ask me, what is it? I said, you don't have faith. You don't have faith in the blood of Christ. She says, well, I want faith. How can I get it? Now, these word of faith people, they say, you got to dredge it up inside. you got to think positive. you got to speak positive. you got to believe. Oh, no, no, you don't have to do any of that. I'm going to give you a magic formula. That's right. <laughs> a supernatural formula today, my friends. You know how you can have faith? You ask for it. You ask for it. You remember what the one man said to Jesus? 
Lord, I believe. Help thou my unbelief. This woman said, I believe the Bible. I believe Jesus. I want to repent for my sins. I've repented for my sins. I'm sorry for them. What do I like? I said, you like faith. She said, well, how do I get it? I said, you ask for it. You really want it and you just ask for it. She said, is it that easy? I said, yes, because there's nothing you can do. There's nothing you can do to have faith. But God will give you the faith that you need if you but ask. The Bible says you receive not because you ask not. I have this question for you today, my friend. Do you have faith in the blood of Christ and its power to take over your life, to lead you? The Bible says in Ephesians and Proverbs, it says that God has already arranged the steps of a righteous person beforehand. You get up in the morning, everything that's going to be happening to you that day is already arranged in advance. <laughs> See, you think you're keeping a holy schedule, huh? God's already got it worked out. Probably your schedule will go awry and God will put you down avenues and opportunities that you didn't even know existed. You couldn't possibly. My friends, do you have faith? You say, Tex Morris, how can I get faith? I want to have faith. Just get on your knees and talk to God. Talk to Jesus and say, Lord, I believe. Help thou my unbelief. This is so powerful. So powerful. You can be weak, but he is strong. And admit your weakness. That's why Jesus said the meek will inherit the earth. They're not cowards. <laughs> They're just meek before Christ. They're willing to say, Lord, I need more faith. I want to believe. I want to have faith in the blood in its miraculous power. And Christ's blood then will protect you. It will empower you. And you'll have peace forever through his eternal redemption. Thank you for listening to Pastor Tex Mars as he just concluded his series, The Power of the Blood. And now we're going to bless you with some more wonderful music from that wonderful medley by the Cathedral Quartet from their 25th anniversary CD. Now when the rich and the poor get together with the Lord, get together, get together with the Lord. Well, they will treat each other like sister and brother when they all get together with the Lord. Well, God has no favorites and we're all the same, they say. We'll see our many friends and our loved ones on the day. We'll all be so happy when St. Peter says this way. Then we'll sing, 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 sing. Now when they all get together, when they all get together with the Lord, well, they will treat each other like sister and brother when they all
with us in worship next week as we continue to honor the remarkable Word of God.